My dear respected brothers, my dear respected ulama, and my dear respected sisters, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah, I've just, uh, I've just arrived and uh, seeing, uh, seeing this crowd, it, it's really pleasing. It's about time that we got together under this banner. If not under any other banner, at least under this banner. And it's about time that we began to respond in, in a proactive way. In a proactive way to some of the allegations that have been taking place. Now, mashallah, I think the ulama before me, they've already probably covered a number of different angles. And the ulama that are to speak after me, they'll cover a number of the remaining angles. I'm going to go off on a bit of a tangent, and I'm going to speak about something that's normally not spoken about. And that is a whole different dimension of this multifaceted personality, Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah. See, majority of us, in fact, probably... All of us know him as the great faqih, the great imam of fiqh and jurisprudence. Very few of us know that he was actually a mutakallim or a theologian, an, an alim or a scholar of usul ad din a scholar of the, the fundamentals of faith, before he was a scholar of fiqh and jurisprudence. And that's the angle I want to speak about because this personality was a person with qabiliya. He was a person with, with ability, a God-given potential, which which also gained acceptance in Qubuliyya. You see, because each one of us has some Qabili, has some ability. The big question is that, is that Qabiliyya going to be attaining Qubuliyya as well? And that's what's important. Because when you look at the Hanafi Madhab and its proliferation throughout the countries, where you can safely say that 50% of the Muslim world, even till today, are followers of the Hanafi school of fiqh, despite the fact that the Hanafi school did not originate in Mecca or Medina Munawwara, but it originated in Kufa, it originated in current day Iraq. Kufa, part of the extended Muslim empire during the time of Umar and Uthman radiallahu anhum, that is where this originated. When, you say, when I say as a madhab, obviously the, the knowledge was brought by the Sahaba from Mecca, from, Mecca, uh, from, from Medina Munawwara to Kufa. It had numerous Sahaba there. Kufa had numerous Sahaba. Now, Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah, this was a genius of a personality. When he met with Imam Malik, rahimahullah, Imam Malik said, when asked about to describe Imam Abu Hanifa, he said that this is such a man that if he says that this pillar, if he claims that this pillar is made of silver or gold, for example, then laqama bi hujjatihi, he will be able to establish the evidences that will prove such a thing. I mean, this man was a genius, a genius. According to, according, to some, uh, according to some ulama, they said that he was so intellectual that even in his standing way and in his process of sitting down, you could just see that this man was an amazing intellectual. Because in the way he did everything. So first he starts off as a businessman because that's what his family heritage was. His family heritage was in business as a trader. And thus he begins as a businessman. Mashallah, a successful businessman. It looks like anything he touched turned to gold, as we say. So he starts off as a businessman. He's, he's not 14 or 15 years old. He's matured. You know, he's probably in his 20s or so. And one day he goes past Hamad ibn Abi Sulaiman, rahimahullah, the great muhaddith of the time, the great faqih of the time, the jurist of the time. And Hamad just looks at him and he says that, you know, who do you go to? Who do you go to? Now, in the, uh, in the lingo of the students and the, and, and, uh, and, and the people of knowledge, it was like, which teacher are you studying by? Because it wasn't like today where you've got, you know, where you have to call somebody like me from London to come and speak in Birmingham. It's ridiculous, right? You had local scholars in multitudes, great experts in each area. And you know, basically, that's that's the kind of thing that we need for this Muslim community to really, really thrive. And Allah Subhanahu wa Taala give us the tawfiq. So he asked, "Who are you going to?" He said, "I'm going to such and such a trader." And he says, "He says like that's not what I'm asking you about." Now he must have noticed something in Imam Abu Hanifa for him to have asked this question. He said, "That's not what I'm talking about. I'm saying which scholar do you go to? Which majlis do you go to for your knowledge?" And he said, I don't go to a majlis for knowledge. He said, I think you should because I see a sign of intellect in you. Hamad had insight. He had firasa. He had, he had great foresight. And he, he put him on the right track. And according to many, this was the inspiration for Imam Abu Hanifa 
undertaking his studies. He was a successful businessman. He was able to, he was able to uh, modify his process in his business such that others would be able to take care of it while he went into studying. Initially, the first thing he started to study was not fiqh, was not jurisprudence. He started to study the usul of the deen. He started to study the fundamentals of the faith. He began to study the theology, the tawheed, and everything related to that. And his focus was on debating with the sectarians of his time. His focus was on dealing with the, uh, with the heretical groups of the time, the Mu'tazila, the Murji'ah, the Khawarij, and uh, num- the Qadariya in their various different forms, the, uh, the, the, the proponents of absolute free will, the Jahamiya, and so on and so forth. Now, he lived in Kufa. Kufa was considered to be a place of turmoil as well, later on, I mean, earlier on as well, because you have to remember, uh, Hussein radiallahu anhu was deceived by some of the people of Kufa. So Kufa has history as well. But Basra was a place where many of these sects grew, where many people with deviant ide- ideologies grew. I mean, there's places right now that are like that as well. I mean, I don't want to say Birmingham is a place like that. But uh, there's places, they just, they've, got, they've, they've just got this propensity, this, uh, this kind of potential to just uh, harbor sectarian ideas. You know, I don't know why that case is, you know, and I think Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala should protect Birmingham. Anyway, um, and all the other cities, you should, you should protect all of us. But basically, you had Basra, it had, it had uh, extreme Shiites, you know, it had extreme Shiites, it had, it had, it had all, you know, it had a whole spectrum of uh, different ideologies. So Imam Abu Hanifa himself says that I went into Basra 27 or more times. And sometimes I stay there for two months, sometimes for three months, and sometimes for a year because I was in debate with somebody. And he silenced many of these, many of these groups. I mean, this man was just such a genius. I mean, you've all heard the famous story. You know, uh, you've all heard the famous story that an atheist, he wanted a debate with Imam Abu Hanifa. And Imam Abu Hanifa said, okay, meet me in such and such a place. Uh, at such and such a time, and the atheist is there with a whole group of people, spectators and so on, and there's no Imam Abu Hanifa. Finally, Imam Abu Hanifa comes late and then he tells his long story. Right, I'm sure you've all heard that story. The long story is that I was coming and there was a stream or a river in between and I couldn't get over, and then suddenly I saw this uh, tree fall into the water on its own, and it made itself into a raft, came in front of me, I got got, got on top of it, and it took me across, and the atheist is just looking at him with absolute disbelief. And then Imam Abu Hanifa said, well, if you can't even agree with this, and you can't believe in this, such a small miniature action, then a micro action, then how can you believe that this entire dunya, the universe, the heavens and the earth, the sublunary and the supralunary world can work without a creator, without a maker, in the macrocosm of things. When you hear that story, it just doesn't go according to his fiqh. It just doesn't, you know, when you normally hear that story, you think he's a faqih, what's he doing dealing with an atheist? But now it's put in perspective because he was a, a scholar of Aqidah before he was a scholar of fiqh. And uh, I'm going to read a few quotes to you. I mean, he himself says that um, Imam Abu Hanifa himself says that I studied Kalam so deeply that I reached a status where people would gesture to me, they'd point to me with their fingers in awe. It's like, that's the man. You know, that's the man who can debate anybody. That's the man who convinces them. That's the man who, who beats them in their, you know, in, their, in their debates. And he convinces them. We used to sit close, to, he said that we used to sit close to the class of Hamad ibn Abi Sulaiman. Now he tells the story here, right? He tells the story here of his conversion to fiqh, right? And I think it's very important for us to understand this. Like you're thinking, why am I talking about this? Well, the reason is that when you understand that this person is a comprehensive personality, a very multifaceted individual, such in such that he's a master of the, any science that he touches. Uh, that he touches, then how can you think that he only knew fifteen hadith? I mean, that's just such an absurd thing to say, right? Doesn't matter who said it, because when he touches aqidah, he becomes a master in that. I mean, he could have started a school, but there was no need for a school at that time. All he had to do was go and uh, uh, go, go and uh, debate with these people, right? But he solidified his foundation in that. And then he touches fiqh and he becomes an absolute master in that, such that until today, 1400 years or so later, you've got half of the Muslim world that follow him or that follow his interpretation. I mean, this is not, was no ordinary man. So then after that, when he focuses on hadith, you think he's going to be left with like 15 hadith? Come on, man, is that a joke? 
right? That's, that's what we really need to understand today, to understand his comprehensive personality that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had gifted. Now, there's a number of... Uh, sorry about this. There's a, there's a number of scholars, for example, Muwaffaq, he relates uh, in his Manaqi from Abu Hafsa Sagheer, that Abu Hanifa studied Kalam. He debated with the people until he became proficient and a master in it. Zaranjari says that Abu Hanifa would lead a class in, 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 in Aqeedah. He would lead a class. I mean, he was a teacher of Aqeedah. Before studying under Hamad, he, he had a class in Aqeedah. He also relates through Harithi that Abu Hanifa said, I was possessed of the skill of skill in theological debate and a period of time passed like this. The people of argumentation and debate were mostly in Basra, for which I entered Basra more than 20 times. Sometimes I would stay for a year. I mean, he left everything and he's going there for the, for the establishment of the truth. I would stay there for a year, sometimes less and other times more. I would debate with the various groups, the Khawarij, the Ibadiyya, the Sufriya, and the groups of the Hashawiyya. Then he relates how he turned to jurisprudence. Now, there's, there's two stories that's related about him turning to Jerusalem. One is that a woman came to him one day. And she asked him a question. She said that, what is the sunnah way of a husband divorcing his wife? So he said, you know, I don't know, but go to Hamad ibn Abi Sulaiman, the faqih, the jurist. Ask him this question. When you, get, when you get a response, then come and inform me as well. She came back and she informed him that Hamad ibn Abi Sulaiman said that when a man wants to divorce his wife according to the sunnah, he should divorce her during her purity period in which he has not had any, uh, any, intim any sexual intercourse with her. And then after that, he should let her be like that until three menstruation cycles pass. And then on the third one, after she has had a ghusl, a bath, out of her third menstruation, then she is free to go and marry somebody else. And that's the way of the sunnah. Imam Abu Hanifa, he says, I've got no need now for, I've got no need now for my, uh, for, for, for these, uh, for these classes and for these debates in Aqidah. He went, he took his shoes and he went and he sat in the class of Hamad ibn Abi Sulaiman. And in a very short time, he says that whenever Hamad ibn Abi Sulaiman would explain anything, would explain a mas'ala, would explain a ruling or an issue, I would memorize it. I would memorize his words. And the next day when he would be asking, what did I say yesterday? Half the people would make an error. And I would know exactly what he said. After a short while, Hamad said that this special place, he gave him a special place and nobody should sit here except Hamad ibn Abi Sulaiman. Um, I'm sorry, except Abu Hanifa. Nu'man ibn Thabit. Rahimahullah. Now, Imam Abu Hanifa, he excelled in such a way that even while his student, uh, while his teacher was alive, Hamad, he could have started his own classes. I mean, this man, this man was of a very high caliber. He, he could have started his own class, but out of respect for his shaykh, he didn't. When, his, when, when the shaykh passed away, there was, there was nothing else that people could do except to push him forward to be the teacher. And that's when he began to teach. And then he created all of these great imams like Imam Abu Yusuf and Imam Muhammad al-Shaybani and Imam Zufar and Imam Hassan and a number of others, Waqi ibn al-Jarrah. And numerous others were in his gathering. Abdullah ibn al-Mubarak, Fudayl ibn Iyad. I mean, you had a massive group of 30, of, uh, of 30 scholars that were with him. And Waqi ibn al-Jarrah later said that, how can you say that Imam Abu Hanifa makes a mistake? If he was to make a mistake, he's got 30 specialists, people proficient in their knowledge around him. If he makes a mistake, they'll, t they'll, they'll, t they'll, they'll direct him in the right way. Because you had, the, you had Fudayl ibn Iyad, some of the greatest ascetics. You had Abdullah ibn al-Mubarak, some of the greatest muhaddithin, and, and, and again, another ascetic, right? Mujahid, uh, Alim, I mean, just, just an amazing man again. And then you had Zufar, and you had Imam Muhammad, and you had Imam Abu Yusuf, and you had so many others. The thing about the Hanafi school is that it's a community effort. It's, a, it's, a, it's an effort of a majlis of at least 30 to 40 scholars. And he says that for sometimes they would, they would debate for th three months on a particular issue if they could not agree on something. And afterwards they would, they would just jot it down as, okay, Abu Hanifa says this, Imam Abu Yusuf says this, and Imam Muhammad says this. And that's why you have the differences of opinion in there. Whereas with the other madhabs, it's normally Imam Malik's opinions, right? It's, uh, the, 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 uh, Imam Malik was a single man effort. And so was uh, Imam al-Shafi, Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal. Later, obviously, the school developed and it's not as simplistic as I'm making it. But the Hanafi school has great flexibility. But anyway, getting back to our, our point under discussion, Imam Abu Hanifa was a great mutakallim. Now, just as in fiqh, the Hanafi school is known for a many hypothetical, uh, hypothetical masail, which is that 
they would debate and discuss a number of issues that had not necessarily occurred yet, but would occur later on. They could just see the foresight. They could fo- foresee them. And they discussed it. I mean, Hanafi school is uniquely known for that. In Aqidah issues as well, he did something similar. Right, because he was at such a such a great, you know, he could see where the trends were going. He could see where the fitna was going, and he was able to deal with a lot of these things. That's why some people they say that there's no way that the five books that are attributed to Abu Hanifa. Now, now, you know, when when you look at Aqidah, Imam Abu Hanifa has five books that are attributed to him. He's got the Al Fiqh Al Akbar. He's got another which is sometimes called Al Fiqh Al Akbar, sometimes called Al Fiqh Al Absat. Right. The reason the this book is called Al Fiqh Al Akbar, Fiqh means understanding, science. Right? Learning, knowledge. Akbar means the greatest knowledge. The reason he wrote Al Fiqh Al Akbar is to ex- uh, explicate and expound on the greater knowledge, which is of Aqidah. Right? As opposed to Al Fiqh Al Asghar, or the, the smaller Fiqh, or the lower Fiqh, which is that of Masail and jurisprudence, which he then embarked on later on. Right? So you've got Al Fiqh Al Akbar. The other one is called Al Fiqh Al Absat, which means the extensive knowledge, because it's it's a lot larger. Then he had Al uh, he had Al Alim Al Mutaallim, and then the fourth book was was his Risala, was his epistle to Uthman Al Batti, and I'll be referring to that later on. And then the fifth one was was his Kitab Al Wasiyah. Now there is some, and I'd like to mention this because as soon as you go out here, somebody's going to say, well, there's uh, these books were not Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah. So I want to explain that a bit. In terms of these books being Imam Abu Hanifa's or not, there's a difference of opinion about each one of them, right? Even the Orientalists would agree that Al Fiqh Al Absat is definitely Imam Abu Hanifa's, and so is his uh, his Risala to Uthman Al Batti regarding the famous Al Fiqh Al Akbar that Maghni Sawi and Mullah Ali Al Qari has a has a commentary on the one that's uh, the one that uh, was translated recently. That one, there is a difference of opinion. However, without going into too much detail about whether it is his or not, one thing that pretty much everybody agrees with. Right, everybody agrees with is that it definitely reflects his opinions. What's contained in there is what his opinions were transmitted to us as being. So that that thing is different. We're not going to waste time in trying to say it's his or not. It doesn't matter. Right? The book is a great book. I will be referencing it later on. What it does, what this book does, is that it puts Imam Abu Hanifa squarely into the realm of the Salaf. In in Aqidah, when you talk about the Salaf, you're talking about the first five generations. Imam Abu Hanifa was squarely in the Sabi. He passed away in 150, well before Imam Bukhari, well before Imam Muslim, right? Well before all of these greats, well before Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal. I mean, Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal passed away in 241. That's about 91 years after Imam Abu Hanifa, right? This man was of the Salaf, and he makes that very clear. In fact, I don't think even those people who like to slander Imam Abu Hanifa on other things, what they strangely do is they try to find every single point they can Right? In some places they'll use him against us, and in some places they'll, they'll basically slander him. It's kind of very strange the way people do this. Because on the one hand, what they take is they take a few, uh, few, a few excerpts from his book, right? Where he says, for example, he says, وَلَا يُقَالْ إِنَّ يَدَهُ قُدْرَتُ وَلَا يُقَالْ إِنَّ يَدَهُ قُدْرَتُ أَوْ نِعْمَتُ لِأَنَّ فِيهِ إِبْطَالُ الصِّفَة Right? Imam Abu Hanifa says in his, in his Fiqh Al-Akbar that it should not be said that the hand of Allah is his qudra, his power, or his ni'mah, his bounty. Meaning you shouldn't uh, explain it in the metaphorical sense, in the figurative sense. Because if you do that, then that, then you are invalidating the attribute of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He was on the manhaj of the salaf. There was nobody that, that I mean, that, that was the general trend at the time. That was the practice, that was the asl, that was the original way of dealing with any verse in the Quran. For example, where it talks about Wherever you face, you will face the wajh of Allah, the, the, the countenance, the face of Allah, right? If I'm allowed to translate it, like there's some people who are against even translating these words, but the majority do allow it, right? As long as you don't do any ta'wil. Now, now what happens, and I want to make this clear, because this is where uh, many people get confused. Some people will take this ibarah, will take this text, and then they'll say to you, that why do you do ta'wil? Now, number one, every common person on the street, the common Muslim today doesn't go around doing ta'wil. Right? That wheel means interpreting. So let me let me let me take a step back and explain this issue to you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, He's used a number of words. He said that the, the hand of Allah, right? Uh, 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 for example, he says that Allah's hand is above theirs. In the in the hadith it says that Allah's hand is with a group. Yadullahi ma'al jama'ah. In uh, in another place it says that wherever you turn, you will see you, you will face the countenance of Allah. You'll find the countenance of Allah, the wajh of Allah. 
So you got a number of these things. Now what happened is that you had a, some literalists, right? Some mujassima, right? Anthropomorphists, you call them. What they did was they took this and they said, well, look, you know, the uh, Allah, he's, he's got a form like a human form, right? Because he says it. I mean, they missed the main ayah. The main ayah is, which governs all of this, which is that there is nothing like unto Allah. So if Allah is saying something in the Quran, which gives you an impression in our mind, because shaitan is always there to try to misguide us, that gives you an impression that there's something else like Allah, that Allah has a hand like the hand of the people, then you must remember that that's not the case, because you must have absolute tanzi and transcendence. You must think Allah above all of these things. So you've got, you've got these terms. So you had this extreme group who said that. You had another group, right, who later, initially they, they, they were complete mujassima. But after Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah, and I'm going to give him that because he was a great imam when it came to fiqh and things. When it comes to aqidah, many people had many problems with him and people went as far as doing takfir. I mean, we're not going to go that far, right? But uh, in, terms of, uh, in terms of fiqh, he was a master. I mean, in terms of aqidah, there were a number of things that many of the great ulama said that he stumbled on. And one of these is what gives rise to many problems today. Many of the polemics today are based on, based on that. Now, after his time, you had less overt mujassima. It was like taken underground. A study will show that afterwards it became more hashawiya or crypto anthropomorphists, hidden anthropomorphists. And that is basically people who will insist. Now, listen to this very carefully. Let me explain the method of the Salaf, the true first generations. The Sahaba and the Tabi'een after them, the great Imams, the way they dealt with, with uh, words like this, terms like this that were mentioned in the Quran, they would say, we leave it to Allah. We believe in it the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has intended it, but we leave it to Allah. We're not going to go in there and make that wheel and interpret it and all the rest of it, right? We're not going to do that. Now, today you have people who say that the method of the Salaf was not that. But it's a different method. They said that the method today, that, that, that was the method of the Salaf according to them, they're projecting this onto the Salaf, onto the true Salaf, is that you must think, you, you must believe that, there's a, that this word yadun or wajhun is literal. It's haqiqah. That Allah has a hand. We're just not going to describe it. Some of them went as far as saying an Ibn al-Jawzi, Abu al-Faraj Ibn al-Jawzi, the great Hanbali scholar who alhamdulillah was not on the Hashawiyya path. He said, my skin, my hair stands on end when I hear some of my fellow Hanbalis saying that you can say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a face, he has a hand, he runs, because all of these things are mentioned in the Quran or Sunnah, but you can't say he's got a head. I mean, can you imagine telling that to a crowd what you're literally doing is that you're making them visualize a form. You can say he's got a face, you can say he's got this, that, but you can't say he's got a head. What kind of a creature are you trying to create? La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. Why do you even need to get to this level? I mean, the Salaf never spoke about it at that level, right? I mean, some went, I mean, some of, the, some of these deviants went even further, right? But I'm just going to focus on what the focus is today. The way of the Salaf is that you just leave them the way they are, you consign their knowledge to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What these people say is that no, if you just consign the matter to Allah and you say we don't know what it means, it means that the Quran has terms that are useless, that are redundant, superfluous, that there's no meaning to them. In order for the Quran to have meaning, you must establish a literal meaning. So when it says hand, he's got a hand. When he's got a face, he's got a face. But we're going to say, it's not like the face of the human beings. It's not like the hand. Why do you even go that far? As I said, it kind of went underground. Instead of being clearly, Allah's got a hand, he's got a face, he's like a human form. They went underground to say, they take you right there and then they stop. It's very difficult, believe me, because the shaitan is always there. When you try to kind of envisage that, he's, hey, he's got a hand, but it's not like the human being hand. It's just a place not to go. Now the later scholars of the Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah, the Ash'aris and the Maturidis, I'll, I'll, I'll go into that a bit, uh, a bit uh, very, very soon. But what they said, what happened is that because of the fitna created by this, these mujassima, the, 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 those who uh, gave Allah a form, 
people began to question. You see, once you create a, a suspicion in the minds of people, curiosity in the minds of people, then shaitan takes over, right? So they had to give something to the people to, to ha- hold on to. So they thought very hard. So the Khalaf, the latest scholars, they agreed among themselves that w- out of the many interpretations, because people are asking for an interpretation, and they won't just sit back and say, okay, leave it to Allah, right? Because th- th- there was just so much development in people's thoughts, and they became a lot more philosophical, and they were not so simple anymore. Imam Ghazali mentions that the, major- the, the people who will go fastest into paradise will be the bala. The simple people who don't, you know, who, who don't question much of these things. You know, I've had people who come and they want to convert to Islam. You sit them down and you ask them like, you know, ask your questions. Some people, they'll go, they've got uh, numerous questions. There was one brother, uh, he came to every single one of our bayans in the masjid, every single program. He was more regular to the programs in the masjid than any of the other Muslims in the area. And it was only after seven months that he knocked on my door after Asr one day and he goes, I've got, I, I'm, I'm ready now. Right, but then there's other people I've had. I'm, I'm like asking, do you have any questions? Because it's it's not a good idea to just throw everybody into Islam and they don't know what they're doing, and then they, and then they go back out because that's worse, right? You don't want that. You want them to have an educated entry into into Islam. But there's some very simple people who don't care about this kind of sophisticated ideologies and so on. They've got their hearts are clean, their hearts are are clear, they're pure, they're sound. You know, qalbun salim. They just enter into the faith. Right? So that's what Imam Ghazali mentions. But you know what you had is you had Islam spread through Persia. Right? You had a lot of uh, uh, philosophy, Greek philosophy, per- peripatetic philosophers coming in, Neoplatonic ideologies and so on and so forth coming in. People had questions. So the ulama said, we can't just tell them to leave it now. So what they decided, some of these great scholars of the Ash'aris and the Maturis, what they decided is that we will try to give an interpretation. And some of this, they actually related from Ibn Abbas radiallahu an. يَوْمَ يُكْشَفُ عَنْ سَاقٍ وَيُدْعَوْنَ إِلَى السُّجُودِ فَلَا يَسْتَطِيعُونَ Surah Noon, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Surah Al-Qalam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that in the Qur'an, Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu does interpretation there. He explains what, sh- he, he gives an interpretation for, for the, the word saq, which literally means shin, right? So they weren't completely doing something new, they weren't innovating something completely new. They made it very clear that to follow the method of the salaf, which was that just leave it to Allah, that is the safest course. That is the safest course. But in light of today's fitna, in the curiosity that people have, and in the deviancy, uh, in the direction of deviancy they're going, we are allowing, we are allowing some amount of ta'wil that's appropriate, rather than rather than some kind of strange, redundant ta'wil that makes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala a creature that, you know, la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah, that anybody could kind of uh, fabricate in their minds. So they allowed it, but they all the time they stressed. Now this is, uh, I'd like to clarify that most of the Hanafis are normally from the Maturidi school. Okay, right? I don't want you to go out there and make a big fitna about this. Alright, if you've never heard about it before, I don't want you to make a big fitna. What are you brother, Maturidi Ashari? I don't want you to do that. Because it doesn't matter. As long as you've got the correct Aqidah, that's what's important. Alright, so I don't want to make this another uh, another point, but I know that there's going to be people who will confuse you. All the Ash'aris are deviant. In fact, when you got these uh, type on the internet, mashallah is proliferated with uh, with these dictionaries and encyclopedias of the deviant groups. And one of them is always the Ash'aris and the Maturidis, and the Hanafis and the Shafis and the Malikis and the Hanbalis. Right? And it's just like these are Dal, Mudil, and these are this, that, and the other. And that's why I'm trying to explain this. Normally, when you look at the Maturi, what happened is that when the group like the Mu'tazila, now this was another group, right? this was another group, they had an idea that what you had to do was, if the human being thought that something was good, then Allah has to also think that thing is good. And if the, if the human being some, thinks that something is bad, then Allah has to also consider that thing to be bad. It's like the intellect of the human being is dictating on Allah what is good and what is bad. These are rationalists, right? And then what they tried to do is they tried to amalgamate, right? Combine Islam and Greek philosophy. Wherever they would be, wherever it would be irreconcilable, they would they would take the philosophical point of view in many cases. That's why they said that you won't see Allah in the hereafter. That's impossible. It goes against the oneness of Allah that you could see Him. So they denied what's clearly mentioned in the Sunnah, in the Ahadith, that you will see Him like you see the moon on the fourteenth night. Right, so they denied that, and they had a number of other opinions. One, uh, another opinion they had was that if a if a mu'min, a believer, commits a major sin, then he's not a believer anymore. So what is he? 
Oh, he's not even a kafir. He's in between somewhere. It's called manzila bayn al manzilatain, the intermediate status between the two. Right? Then you had another group that went a step further. They said, and these were the takfiris, in a sense. They hated Muslims that didn't apply, that didn't, uh, um, that, that didn't uh, adhere to their madhab and their way of understanding. Then they did kuffar, right? Now, now, the reason I'm mentioning all of these things, you might be wondering, why do I bring up this history? The reason is that there, there are remnants of all of these groups today, not as an organized group, but there will be individuals. For example, there's a professor in uh, University of uh, UCLA, University of California, Los Angeles. He considers himself a Mu'tazilite. There's another British author who considers himself a Mu'tazili, right? You've got people who go around doing takfir of everybody. If you, if you commit a major sin, it's like, you know, you're, you're not a Muslim anymore. You're, you're wajibul qatl or you're permissible to kill. In fact, you know, it's, obligat- it's obligatory to kill you. So you've got the takfiri groups as well. I'm not saying all of the people who go around doing takfir are the same. There's many shades in them, right? So you had this khawarij. What they said was that any Muslim, any believer who commits a major sin, right? Fornicates, steals then he becomes, they took him right to kufr. They said, forget this in between status, this hybrid, right? He's, right? he's a kafir, right? Now, in response to that, you had all these strange ideas coming up. In response to that, you had the murjia. These were a group, they said, what's all this takfir going on? What's this taking everybody out of the faith? They went to another direction. They said that it doesn't matter what sin you commit, as long as you're a believer, brother, you're fine, Right? And you hear this a lot more. And that's why I think the bigger fitna today is of uh, secular Islam, progressive Islam, modernist Islam. Because what they're going to do is at least uh, others are saying, go back to the sunnah, destroy everything in between. Forget what the imam said, forget what all these great Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani and others said. Go back to the hadith, brother, the sunnah, brother. Right? But... You know, there's some, I mean, at least they're not going out of the faith. There's others who are just like saying, no, don't take anything. As long as you're a Muslim, as long as you consider yourself a Muslim, that is sufficient. You can sin as much as you want, it won't affect your iman. Good deeds won't make you any better. It's just a good thing in terms of a social sense, but in terms of your deen, la yadurru, la 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 yadur. You know, your, your sins will not, will, will not um, harm you. You had another group who, when they saw the khawarij making people, con- con- uh, condemning to them to disbelief, they said that's wrong. I mean, the position of the Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah, which everybody should agree with, is that anybody who is a believer, who has accepted the faith, then it doesn't matter how many sins he has done. If he seeks forgiveness, Allah will forgive him. Insha'Allah. Right? We've got the hope in Allah because Allah is forgiving. If he does not seek forgiveness and he dies as a sinner, he is a believer, but he's a sinner. And he is what the famous term is, تحت المشيئة. He is under the will of Allah. Allah says in the Quran, إن الله لا يغفر أن يشرك به ويغفر ما دون ذلك لمن يشاء. Allah does, will not forgive that shirk be made with him, that you impartner with him, that you ascribe partners to him. But he will forgive every other sin. And if you say that that means in the world, then uh, that, that means uh, in the hereafter. Well, of course, in the hereafter, because if you've done shirk in this world and then you've become a believer, you're not a mushrik anymore. So there's no shirk to deal with in the hereafter. So it has to refer to people who die as a mushrik and those who die as sinners but mu'mineen. The Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah, we believe that anybody who dies a sinner but a believer, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will deal with them according to he wish, uh, the way He wishes. And there's many ahadiths that, that explain that. If he wills, he can punish him. And it will be completely out of his justice to do that. If he doesn't want to punish him and he likes a single act that he did, he will forgive every single sin of his and send him into paradise. It's entirely up to Allah. You know what the Mu'tazila said? They said that Allah has to give you reward as much as is as much as you did only. He can't give you a bonus. He can't give you extra. He can't just forgive you. He has to punish you for your sin. They like obligate these conditions and he, they put Allah in all of these conditions. Right? Deviant group. Khawarij, they'll just take you completely out of Islam, right? Now the murji'ah, what, uh, uh, what the, 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 the deviant murji'ah, the deviant, what you call them, the postponers, the antinomians, I mean the Christians have dealt with it from Paul. Paul is considered an antinomian. I mean these are people, I mean you heard, the, you heard the Christians all the time, Jesus died for you on the cross. You basab mazekaro. 
You know, you can do what you like. As long as, you know, you kind of just go and sing on Sunday and have a bit of wine and uh, uh, bread, right? You're fine. It creates this, it creates this laxity. It creates this antinomian tendency, which is that it's okay. It doesn't matter. As long as you've got faith, you're fine. You hear so many people today, especially people who consider themselves intellectual, intellectual Muslims, right? In that sense of the term. They say, as long as you've got a good heart, as long as you've got a good heart, it doesn't matter what you do. It's like, do whatever you want in your bedroom, it's okay. Right? La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. I believe that this is a greater threat. Because as more people go into academics in, our, in this country, as more of our Muslims, they, they have to be really careful. Because academics, which is, we're going to have to go into it to make any difference in this country. But the people who will go into it have to be very careful. Because when you become a bit overawed by the various philosophies that you will learn and the various different ideologies, you have to be very firmly grounded in your aqidah and your understanding. Otherwise, you may adopt something else. And you will come back and re-look at Islam. And you will then adjust it, modify it to suit, your, to suit, to suit what you think is correct. The Prophet ﷺ mentioned that a time will come when a person will have some food have a nice full stomach and he will say that let's talk on the base of the Quran forget the Sunnah I'm paraphrasing the ulama mentioned that the reason he mentioned the food there is because it will normally be people who will be well off I'm not saying it's bad to be well off the Prophet ﷺ said that so, so virtuous is halal wealth in the hands of a pious person the problem is that when people are relaxed they don't have to struggle where Allah comes out of the picture then because then they become dependent on their wealth and then they start thinking of things rationally because that's what the shaitan wants. And that's a major fitna, that's a greater fitna. Believe me, that's going to be a greater fitna in 10 years because America is already there. We're not there yet because alhamdulillah we have stronger connection with our masajid. But you will see that people will move out. As the communities grow, the children can't buy in the same area. People, it's expensive. People will go out to other areas. You won't be so close to the masjid anymore. You won't be so close to your ulama anymore. And then you'll start thinking for yourself. Because you're an intellectual now. You're an academic. Right? You know, you've got a degree. I'm not saying it's bad. We have to do that. But you have to be strongly in your tradition. You have to be strongly with your ulama. Otherwise, in 10 years, you will see it. And I've seen in America the kind of questions. You know, in America, you couldn't even start off with saying that, you know, for example, if somebody said, is music, what's the status of music in Islam? You couldn't say music is haram. They just walk away. They think this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. You would have to start by first explaining the negatives of music, modern research and how it shows that music is harmful. Then after you've kind of explained it from a scientific point of view, right, and opened the door to their heart or mind, right, then you can say, and Imam Malik, Imam Malik rahimahullah called it the batil. And by the way, it's also haram in Islam. Right? Seriously. This is a major problem that we have. This is a bigger problem that we have. And we have to really study these personalities greatly. So anyway, going back to Imam Abu Hanifa, we had this, this murji'a. Some people call Imam Abu Hanifa a murji'a. Now again, this is one of those things where they just try to find anything and everything. Okay, 15 hadith, they don't look at it rationally. This great man, great scholar of usul, great scholar of fiqh. You only know 15 hadith, I mean, was he tricking the whole world? Is 50% of the world dumb, deceived? But I guess that's what they think anyway, right? You're talking about 40 million or more people in, in China, they're Hanafis. And they've been following this. You had the great scholars, I mean, great intellectual people like Tahawi, right? Who, who became a Hanafi because they saw in it what they thought was the closest to the Quran and the Sunnah. So now you had this murji'a. There was a, you see, when all this khawarij problem happened, there were the Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah, like Imam Abu Hanifa. He made it very clear. This is what he said. He says, Wala naqul. We don't say that anna al mu'min la tadurruhu al dhunub. We don't say that if a mu'min commits sins that it won't be harmful to him? Meaning, we consider sins to be harmful to a believer. وَلَا نَقُولْ إِنَّهُ لَا يَدْخُلُ النَّارِ We're not going to say that he's never going to enter the hellfire, because that's what the Murji'a said. That um, as long as you're a believer, you're, you're paradise. You're saved. وَلَا نَقُولْ أَنَّهُ يُخَلَّدُ فِيهَا But we also don't believe that they will be forever in the hellfire, as the Khawarij said. Right? And then he said, وَإِن كَانَ فَاسِقًا بَعْدَ أَنْ يَخْرُجَ مِنَ الدُّنْيَا مُؤْمِنًا As long as he came out of the dunya as a believer with some faith, 
even though he was a fasiq, transgressor, and he was a uh, he, he was unrighteous. Wala naqul inna hasanat inna hasanatina maqbula. We don't say that all of our good deeds are certainly accepted by Allah. It's up to Allah. Because when we do our good deeds, we ask then Allah to accept them. It's not like the Mu'tazila who like, you do a good deed, he has to accept them, he has to reward you. According to a meter. وَسَيِّئَاتِنَا yeah. or, uh, or that our bad deeds are definitely forgiven. We don't say that. It's up to Allah. كَقَوْلِ murji'ah. As the Murji'ah said, he makes it very clear what the Murji'ah said and he distances himself from this. So how can Imam Abu Hanifa be a Murji'ah? I'll tell you, he was a Murji'ah. But not this Murji'ah. And this is where the confusion is. But people can't even investigate that. They take it from somewhere. And they just attribute it because it sounds bad. It's like when you're arguing with somebody, this is what, why arguments and quarrels are so bad. The Prophet ﷺ said that if you leave quarreling, while you're on the wrong, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you a place on the outskirts of paradise. And if you leave arguing with somebody, even if you're on the right, you'll get a place in the middle of paradise or in the highest places of paradise. Because quarreling is so bad, even when you're in salat, and the guy is next to you, you're going to be thinking of uh, uh, points about him. The way he prays or whatever. Right? It, that's what argument, uh, argumentation does and disputation. That's why it's, it's just so bad in the deen. Right? Those kind of raw polemics. So now... What happened is that the, they were the, the, the Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah, those who were clear, because Imam Abu Hanifa made it very clear, he said that, what are these khawarij talking about? Actions are not part of faith in the sense that if you don't do good deeds that you're a kafir. As long as you believe in your heart and you confess with your tongue, you are a believer. Yes, if you do good actions, your quality of faith is very, very good. right? And you got a lot of good deeds. The Khawarij was saying, no, the person goes out of Iman. It's like the person doesn't have Iman in his heart. So Imam Wanifa said that, you know, uh, Iman is conviction in the heart and confession with the tongue. So what the Khawarij labeled Imam Abu Hanifa as a murji'ah. He said, you're a murji'ah. They, they said you are a postponer. Because you are saying that leave the decision to Allah. Because that's what we say. Leave the decision to Allah. So you're a murji'ah. Because what murji'ah means, people who put judgment behind them. Don't be judgmental. But it's not the extreme one. So that's why the ulama have uh, separated the murji'ah into two groups. The murji'ah of the Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah, which any great alim of, uh, any, any, any person of the Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah would be a murji'ah in that sense because they won't insist that your sins will take you to hellfire. But, and then the second group are the murji'ah of the, the, the innovators, the reprehensible innovators, right, which Imam Abu Hanifa speaks out about. So what happens is that Orientalists, I mean, they're the ones who are still talking about Imam Abu Hanifa as a murji'ah and so on, because they like to discuss everything. So these people find that and say, Imam Abu Hanifa is a murji'ah. And in their concept, the murji'ah is one of the bad murji'ahs. So that's where that problem comes from. So when next time you hear that, inshallah, you'll be able to, you'll be able to explain that murji'ah just means to postpone, because the Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah, as you also say that um, uh, if you do a sin, it's under the will of Allah. That's what murji'ah means, according to the Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah. The sectarian murji'ah, that's a whole different story. Now the other thing I want to explain is that normally it's the Ash'aris who are condemned. And the murji'ah seem to, uh, I'm sorry, the, the Maturidis, they kind of uh, get out scot-free. Let me explain a bit of history. In the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدْ Suratul Ikhlas was sufficient. People were just so pure, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam being there, قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدْ was more than enough aqeedah. That was the aqeedah you studied. You didn't have all of these other questions. Where is Allah? You know, this constant questioning of where is Allah? And uh, brother, you know, do you understand the three different types of tawheed? Do you believe in them? You know, we should believe in all of the different types of tawheed. Tawheed al-uluhiyya, rububiyya, asma' al-sifat. But to have every person on the street know these things and be able to like repeat them you know at, at a bidding it's like in france you know the if you're if you're not a french person you have to pull your identity cards out it's like brother you know subhanallah i was sitting in the road of the prophet sallallahu and there was one of those guys that stand outside uh, protecting the grave right mubarak and uh, this this was a nicer person he had a smile on his face Right, and he would tell you nicely, and he'd, he'd actually have people look inside to say, "Look, there's nothing there." It was his way of telling them, "You don't need to do anything." Right? I just sat there, and then eventually he started speaking to me. And what happened is, within, wallahi, within about a minute or something, 
if I remember correctly. He he said, Brother, uh, Ya Akhi, Ayn Allah. Where is Allah? So I said, Thumma stawa ala al arsh. Qar Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Thumma stawa ala al arsh. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is on his arsh. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mustawi. He's, uh, he's, he's established on his throne. Istiwa on the arsh. So I said, Okay. Right? And then I said, Well, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also says, Inna Allah. Uh, in Allah ma'as-sabirin, Allah is with the patient people. He's with the patient people. Aqrabu ilaykum min hablil walid. He's closer to you than your jugular vein. So he goes, Falanta Salafi. Are you a Salafi? I said, Yes. Alhamdulillah. Right? I said, Alhamdulillah. And then I belabored him on this point of istiwa because I think he had some doubt. I think he had some doubt. So he said, Mustawin al arsh, yani mustaqirun al arsh. I said, La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. Because what they do is they take this word istiwa ala al which means clearly just establishment on the throne. That's the closest translation we can get to. Even that's not a perfect translation. Allah made istiwa on the arsh. Whatever that means, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. But they say istawa, we have to make that as istiqrar, which means to find a place, to find settle. Right? That connotes physical sitting. Right? And that's what some of them said that Allah is touching the arsh not from the above, but from below. And it, it, it's la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. Can you imagine that, as Imam Abu Hanifa says, Ali radiallahu anhu said, that Allah was, uh, Allah was existent when there was no arsh. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the arsh. Allah is the creator of the arsh. Imam Abu Hanifa makes it clear in his kitab al wasiya So the person said, mustaqirun al arsh. I immediately, I said to him, that you're doing ta'wil. Because you're not leaving it the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said it, but you're saying that istiwa has to mean istiqrar, which means resting. I got him on that one. I don't think he ever came across that response. Right? And that, and I want to just mention, if anybody asks you, where is Allah? Right? Imam Abu Hanifa makes it very clear. Well, number one, the first answer is that the question does not apply to Allah. Because ayna means fi ayyi makan. In which place is he? Allah is out of place. Allah is beyond place. He created place and time, so he's not in, in time or place. Number one. Number two, answer, answer, the answer to this is from the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ma'as sabirin. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is with the people who have taqwa. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mustawin al arsh. And you just refrain from going beyond that. So clearly, I mean, just to, just to finish off, now you understand this personality who was multifaceted in the sense that he's not just a great faqih, which he became most prominent as, but he was also a great scholar of Aqidah. But according to uh, the other story, he said that I noticed that it was just getting me into too many arguments. I was wasting a lot of time in that and I found out that it wasn't a worthy cause to go into the argumentative side of it. So I left it and I went into the study of fiqh. Now how can you call somebody like that to be ignorant of hadith? Any subject he touched, he became a master in that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the tawfiq. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the understanding of this great imam. And I'm sure we'll be enlightened a lot more by uh, the, the shiyukh after, uh, shiyukh after me about Imam Abu Hanifa's position.